go. So I need to let me. Uh, I closed. Okay. So you should be the host. Excuse me. You should be. Should have that. Let's go ahead and give you this. But I gave you the handed it off to you, so you should be sharing. Stop share. Okay. Let's see how this works. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. So can you hear me? Can you everybody hear me in here? No, this mic is not for y'all. The yeah. mic is for the, the streaming. <laughs> and to look weird all night long on my face. because His lips are moving. His mouth is moving. and I don't hear anything better. So I'll try to speak up a little bit. But that means you have to then be quiet. But yeah, the mic is for the, the webinar side. So are we, are we broadcasting okay? Phil? Phil? Yes. Which best we can tell. So, so thanks everybody for coming out and letting me uh, flap my gums for a while here at your gathering. And uh, I'm Jeff, network guy. Okay, how many other network folks are in the room? Real, I'm gonna say real network folks. Not network wannabes, network I can do okay, real day job, you know? All right. So everybody else is not network. Would well, that be basically true? But you can do, okay, so we can, mm, do okay in networking. Topics, terminology, understanding. All right, that helps a little bit, probably a good thing. Uh, one of my other questions, who is really, really familiar with IPv6? Well, that would be a good thing then, since the talk is on IPv6, all right, who has ever kind of played with IPv6? You got a kind of an inkling about IPv6, but you're not real sure how much of that inkling is, right? And hopefully tonight will assist in, in that. That's part of my goal. So we're gonna talk about V6. We will eventually, as they say, right, eventually get to the um, IPv6 security assessment tools. Now, for those that can't see me online, I'm winking, okay? Because we have to say security assessment tools in polite business discussion. Because if you use the term hacking, people get weird and they get a little upset and they get a little concerned. They start looking for the door for you, you know, if you start saying. So there's security assessment tools. Yeah, 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 it's hacking tools. Actually, it's multiple things. They could be used for bad things, we'll say hacking in a bad way. They could or understanding the protocol better by inducing things that aren't normal or operations that are not normal. That's actually where I started using the tools. Well, it's great and fine. I understand how V6 is working, uh, but what happens if, and I wanted to introduce the ifs because I couldn't figure out any other way to do it. Uh, later on I did. I actually will show you some of those ways of doing that. So that's the kind of the, uh, the thrust of this topic of these conversations, and of course the clicker's not gonna work. Nothing's working. Oh, probably, there we go. So let me back up. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on V6 today. Everything you know about work now is based on what I call louder. IPv4, but we don't call it anymore. We call it. All right, but it is really IPv4. We have to, I'm doing something with IP, I'm going to predict which version. And most people are going to look at me and go, Goober, what do you mean, which version? Right? Well, that's because there are multiple versions. Who in here has been around in networking in any flavor long enough to have played with other protocols like, oh, Apple Talk, IP, I, uh, IPX, SPX, uh, uh, any of the other, I'll call them even older protocols, Xerox had a protocol, DEC had a protocol. If you're that old, we don't do that stuff anymore. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up in Wikipedia, all right? 
that actually don't waste your time. It's old stuff, all right? Most everybody in today's world is dealing with like one networking protocol, but we have a couple. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time because you have the things you know about IPv4, only parse translate to IPv6. All right, all the terminology you know in IPv4 for IP networking, eh, there's about 50% new ones. And some of the words have changed. The operations may be the same, but the words are different. So once I would say we get some of these IP uh, basics, operational basics down, everything else I'm going to talk about will make a little bit more sense. Otherwise, I'm just going to be flying a whole bunch of terms and words and everything else out. It's going to be, what does that mean? I don't expect in an hour and a half you're going to get everything, all right? If this is the first time, great, great. You should hear it and do it a lot more, all right? Uh, whether it's me or anybody else. Who's ever heard me do an IPv6 presentation before? Okay, no laughing, no correcting, unless I did it really, really wrong, and that's okay. And if it's a repeat, then cool, so it will be. Talk a little bit about from a security uh, issues viewpoint, okay? We're which will lead us into the rest of the stuff. I'm gonna spend a few minutes in Wireshark. Who uses Wireshark daily? Almost, at least weekly. Has ever used Wireshark? The other direction, who has never used Wireshark or any other packet I'm right? spend just a few minutes in Wireshark because not only is it an awesome packet analysis, packet capturing tool, you can break it. You get you the visa if you need to be here. All right. So I'm going to show you a few things about that. And then finally, we're going to see all this in operation. All right. So that's the basic plan. A little bit of trivia. V6. It is the year 2019. It is the second decade of the 21st century. Is IPv6 an enabled protocol in almost any operating system? Yes? Yes. No. no. We're not really. Well, the answer is yes, all right? It is an, an enabled protocol in most client OSs. I'd have to say not in every one that I know of, in most server operating systems, but not in routing operating systems. Generally, it is not. However, that is starting to change. You actually see one vendor now, V6 is enabled by default on the first interface. All right, routing, layer three switches, the whole bit. So we're getting it. But for the most part, the regular rank and file operating system, it's enabled. Um, in V6, on an interface, can I have more than one IP6 client address? Think about it in, from a V4 thinking. In IPv4, I can be a 1.1.20, but I cannot also be on the same interface 10.1.1.21. Who would agree with that? All right. Now, you may think of, well, I could be 10.1.1.20, 10.1.2.20, if they were all slash 24s. All right. I can do that. We call it multi netting, sub netting, uh, secondary addresses, lots of other things. But those are two different networks. In V6, I could have the equivalent of a dot 20, dot 21, dot 22, dot 23, as many as I want on the center face. We don't do that in V4. You cannot do that in any operating system I've ever come across. Big difference that we have in V6. And the great is let all three be used for different things without you directing that operation. <laughs> which makes troubleshooting that much more fun. You're troubleshooting on one source of destination address, and the next thing you know, the client does something else using V6 and uses a different address. And you're like, where did that traffic go? Well, you weren't looking for that traffic, all right? So that's a, a, a interesting thing. Six world, come on, clicker. All right, we're going to have to do it. In V6, we're going to have a number of different addresses. This GUA acronym stands for Global Unicast Address, which effectively means a routable address. It allows me to get off my local V6 network to a router and go somewhere else. All right. Um, how many of these GUA or routable cap route capable addresses can I have? And Basically, um, I, I may have four by default on the network prefix. 
I could have more, but I could have up to four with very little effort. Uh, and I will also follow that up with, that is not a desirable function. <laughs> All right? It doesn't mean it won't work, doesn't mean it's not legal, doesn't mean that things will break, but it probably not what you want to have happen for that same reason. Different addresses may get used for different things, and that's just that one. All right, so we're going to have problems with this. How many can I have? I can have lots, okay? Something on the order of thousands in some operating systems to have all these different addresses we probably don't want. Now, another address we have in X, uh, yes? One. And no Starbucks card. <laughs> right. Which part? Okay. Why do we have multiple addresses? It's a great question. And part of the reason is, um, if I give a little history, but I'll also friend it with saying, it allows me to gracefully change network prefix addressing on the fly without having to do a stop everything, readdress, and restart. So if we think about that from an IPv4 thinking, if I need to IP my network, readdress my entire network, right? You have to send out the galactic email on Friday afternoon. Everybody shut your computer down at home. Everybody comes in in IT on Saturday. They do all this work. They turn it all back on and hope Monday that things work. Who has been through that process before? All right, readdress the network. And how well did Monday work? Not at all. 75%, 85%. Really good except for that critical application that everybody uses that IT didn't know about. Because it's sitting low, right? And it's running a company from all practical perspectives, right? And no one knew about to go address that. And V6, part of the reason why I have multiple addresses, I can change my addressing on the fly. I'm going to speak to a little bit more about this later. And so uh, you could do it in the middle of the day in the production and not have a hiccup, uh, which is a really, really great thing. It was part of a designed in process. This other type of address is known as a link local six address. There is an, an analogy on this link local address to the APIPA address, the 169.54 operating systems today employ, right? You turn on a brand new computer with almost any client level OS, if there's not connected to, even to the network, or if it is, it's trying to do DHCP requests looking for an address. If nobody replies, it self-assigns that APIPA address. Uh, it's actually, you know, Microsoft has came about with this in XP to help uh, introduce a network of people involved, right? And everybody else adopted. Uh, in between, we have some sign comes up when operating system and these are up and signs is linked local. However, the difference here is now the link local address never goes away. In the APIPA world, in V4, it goes away as soon as you either get a DHCP address or you statically assign it or goes away. Case in link local, and in the link local address is used for communications on that local subnet, on that layer two domain. So I'll use link local to talk address to talk to California. All right. The link local address is not a routable address. The other most interesting thing is link local address only works for that interface. So if I happen to have a multiple interface device, whether it's a computer with a bunch of VM uh, and virtual networks, or it's a server with a bunch of physical networks, a router, uh, whatever, they can all use the same local address because it's only good for that interface. It doesn't route, so it doesn't know about the interface, so it, nobody cares. And this is really, really handy in those environments, like in routers, layer three switch routing, uh, perhaps even servers, could I give all of them the same link local address, perhaps statically assign it as opposed to them deriving it. So you, it, again, some things are gonna be a little bit different than what you might be used to, uh, but it's important as they say, to know these things. All right, a little bit more. Uh, interesting, this is my fun one. How does an IPv6 host get its default gateway information? Who would say you statically find it? 
as an option. Anybody? Oh, come on. This is audience participation. Night. Who would think you get it from your DCP server? That's the way it's working. And both of those would be, that is not how it works at V6. In fact, as of the standards today, there is no field in a DHCP V6 scope for default gateway. In some operating system, there is no option to set an IPv6 default gateway because it is derived from a new source from what we call this router advertisement. A router will basically sit there periodically say, hey, I'm a V6 router on this network. Um, and we will hear that as a V into my router table. All right. And there's a couple of ways that some operating systems like Windows has a field for default gateway. You can fill that all you want. It doesn't get used. The only way the system uses a router is learning it through the router advertisement. So um, it's really great fun for the network guy to hand over to the server guy. Here's all your stuff for your DHCP v6. Here's the range, here's the blah, here's the DS, here's blah, blah, blah. Guess what the server guy does to the network guy? You dumb network guy, where's the default gateway? <laughs> you don't get one, you got no place to put it. All right, and, and they don't necessarily know that yet. Now, there is some uh, discussions going on and some possible changes to that behavior because people don't like it, all right? They want the DHCP server to give out the gateway. So there is discussions, there's a draft RFC talking about it. There's one particular um, um, DHCP service uh, or server service entity that has written it in, but it isn't standard. There's no client OS is using it yet, so it doesn't matter. But it's one of those behavioral functions. No, you have to have a router sent out a router advertisement. We're sending out RAs. Which one would I use? I can all right. Just so I want router the prior my back. If I two to ever be router, then I block the router advertisement because we already have it covered. Um, actually, you can set the preference either. You can set it on the router to say, don't send router advertisement. And most client OSs also allow you the capability to say, don't listen. The problem is when you say don't listen, they don't. So you, you, you lose it. So yeah, that's when you have to go to the router and say, make sure you don't. So like, um, Router to router links don't need to know about each other with that. We're going to know it through routing protocols or static routing. All right, so they don't need router advertising. So you don't actually need those RAs and you would block them on router, router links. Most of the time, router client links we want through router advertisement. And if we get multiple routers, then we might have a redundancy protocol in play. So we would uh, have only one of them sending the RA. So couple of another one of these differences and I got a great little demo about well uh, coming up all right uh, talked about that DHCPv6 does not have an option for a default gateway at this point now I kind of gave you a hint on this if I want to talk to my router say I want to go to San Francisco all right am I going to use my link local address audible address to talk to my router Link local or router or GUA address, right? And the link local, why? I think everybody said about the same thing. So I'll say, I'll, I'll say it this way. Remember, I always talk to my devices on my local subnet using my link local address. So I'll use my link local to communicate to the router, but I'm also passing my routable address so everybody knows upstream, right? It's got to get back to the router and where the router has got to send it to. So it's an interesting effect when you start troubleshooting, and I'm gonna always use the term more troubleshooting for a while, whether you're troubleshooting or attacking, all right, as to what you might want to be doing, what you might want to be looking for, all right, depending on what type of traffic I want to, let's say, disrupt, because I'm testing. 
<laughs> we're testing, right? Then do I attack the link locals or do I attack the GUIs, right? Because I might attack one address and cause one kind of thing, but not another. So there's, there's some really interesting components of communications that go on. All right, I'm almost done. Um, in V6, um, we've got this notion of being an, uh, or hitting, um, let me back up. We had this capability of auto configured addresses. IPv6 came about when IPv4 was not young, but it wasn't old. It wasn't quote as mature. Like, IPv6 is a released perspective. It's 20, 20 years old now. All right. It was being formed back in the mid 90s. So one of the com uh, components of V6 design was auto configuration. No configuration anywhere. Everything just kind of comes up, turns on, and starts working automatically. And um, one of those was um, the capability, how do you self-assign an address? Well, if you're starting from nothing, how do you do that? You have to have something to start from. It would start from the MAC address of that network interface as a starting point. And it would use the MAC address embedded into the full address scope, which was a great and wonderful thing. However, as soon as anybody would get that kind of, got the MAC address built in, it's very quickly to uh, enumerate that backwards and find out, oh, what is this? Possibly even what category device is it from that manufacturer, all right? So another thing called this privacy mode, which uh, a random number generator and generated a, a, a partial address. All right. um, in the case of auto compared to statically signed address, which one of those routable addresses do you think would get used? Do you think it would be the privacy address or do you think it would be the static address? Because remember, now I'm doing something we don't have a comparison to before. I've got two address host addresses in the same network on this device. Which one will it use? And there is an answer, and it will use one of these temp or one of these privacy addresses called the theory. And there are some potential behavioral changes at the client OSs, depending on the client OS, where you can say, well, yes or no or use this one, use that one. But again, following quote unquote all the standards and the base, the static address, because that's what we're used to in V4. All these comparisons to what we're used to in V4, we call it V4 thinking. The other we follow up with, stop it. <laughs> Sometimes you can't do the comparison. Sometimes you have to basically throw that part of that knowledge off to the side because it's a new day. There's a new way things are going on. Um, oh, this is another one of my favorites. If I'm going to communicate to anybody in the room, let's say we have link locals and we also have our GUA addresses, which address do I use? Talk to anybody in the room. Link local or GUA? All right. Link local, I think I heard. All right. And um, we're not going to need a gateway. We'll use our link locals. We learn about or can learn about each other's link local without anything else involved. All right. So um, the other problem is even if we've got GUA addresses, I can force a comms. I can ping your routable address that you have, whether it's statically assigned or DHCP v6 assigned. And you could ping me only if that router for that subnet is online. If that router's not there, we can't do it. Like in V4, I can ping 20 and 21 without a router. In V6, I cannot ping colon 21 and colon 20 without the router because since that is a global unicast router, what do we do with this? The router says, it's on link. Oh. All right. If the router's not there, there's no pinging between each other on these routable addresses. I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. All right. Finally, we're done. A little bit of history. All right. It all started back in the early 90s when everybody said, oh, wait a minute. Everything we're doing in the V4 world, first of all, who was networking in the early 90s? Whether you're internet or not, you're, if you were using IP, everything was manually assigned. Everything was what we call public addresses. There was no NAT. There was no RFC 1918 private addresses. It was all manual. And the architects kind of said, you know what? 
uh, we're probably going to run out of these 4.2 billion addresses in the two, early 2000s at the rate things were going. This is pre-public internet days as well, right? When they started. So they kickstarted this whole thing off and say, we need to come up with a better way. In the meantime, things like DHCP, uh, NAT, RFC 1918 came about as temp stop gaps till the new internet protocol next generation, it was called IPNG, would be available. And while all that was being worked on, it boiled down to uh, three different committees working on three different versions. Finally, we came up with what we now know as IPv6. It was released in 1999. It was thrown up on the, on the global internet, six bone. And, and a few people were participating, and there we have it. But everything was being designed from an aspect we want auto capability, self capability, and uh, things like uh, being able to readdress the network cleanly on the fly, all kinds of cool stuff. And so a lot of that came about uh, throughout that time. And we're still, I'd say, in B6. Uh, the RFCs are still being tweaked and being tuned, kind of the good news and the bad news. Uh, ten years, and there are notable changes in my my tenure time. Evolution with it. Uh, in V6, the address range or address space is 128 bits. Yields 340 decillion addresses. That is not a made-up number. Go look at names for. For number words or word numbers, right? It, it it looks it looks made up. It sounds completely bogus, um, but in theory, there are 340 uh, actually 340 and change uh, addresses. All right, everybody really looks at that and go, yeah, 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 whatever. All right. Oh, by the way, IPv5 did list live as a standard. It was related to multicast, but it never made it. And so it got skipped. That's why we have IPv6. Generally, I get asked that question. Uh, so there is a bunch of in a V6 world. Uh, V6 uses colons every 16 bits as the delimiter, not dots. They didn't ask Jeff. I would have said, don't use a shifted character. I'm not a typist. Although I'm getting really good at shifting and calling these days uh, as time goes on. Um, every 16 bits, we get a colon. There's eight groupings of those 16 bits. Uh, in V4, we call our 32-bit dotted decimal. In V6, it would actually be um, 128-bit uh, hexadectet. And in, in the South, hexadectet is kind of hard to say because we got to throw at least another syllable in there, right? Just our way. Um, and so there's a couple of other terms that have become more useful, uh, more prominent. Uh, and there's actually an RFC that has um, discussed this in a lot of detail. Some people wanted to use the word chunk. Well, that's not techy enough. That just, that, you know, you say chunk in a conversation to senior management, they're like, hey, what are you talking about, Jeff? All right. But uh, quibble stands for quad nibble. All right, every four bits, so you got four, four bits in a 16 bit, blah, blah. All right, or hextet. Hextet is not numerically correct, but it fits, and it's easy, all right? We can spell it, mostly, all right? So hextet is each of those 16-bit groupings. So I've got eight hextets, all right, in my V6 address, and it's alphanumeric. So everybody that was doing Apple Talk and Novell IPX SPX, back in the day, we used hexadecimal. We spelled words in our network addresses. We're back, all right? I hated that with V4. I lost my words that I wanted. You know, dead beat, foosball, Dallas. I've got it in here, right? Uh, six lap, foosball, Dallas, across those. That's the great news. Don't use hex words in your public facing addresses. Why? The bad guys are gonna attack that first. There's all kinds of four digit hex word databases out there to help the search. So you've just narrowed that search field of 340 undecillion down to a lot less. All right, of somebody trying to do a number by number uh, in the lab, fine. Oh, but by the way, Facebook didn't listen to Jeff. Why should they? In their fifth and sixth hectet is F-A-C-E-B-O-O-C. All right, so. Sure, do it, 
but really don't. Not in a room full of folks like us. Yes, please do. All right, but not for your own stuff. In a lab, again, it's just fine to do it in a lab. But uh, uh, fun stuff with that. Now, a lot of people get really upset. When I, I barely remember my 32-bit address. You're going to throw 128 bits at me? I ain't ever doing it. Who thought that? Um, we call it V4 thinking. We call this old guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just hoping I can retire out before I have to do this thing. And my, my thing is, a new day, you want to be up to date, you got to learn it. All right. Well, the cool thing about 120 usage, and in fact, the only usage in some the four bits of the network space, four bits are the um, what we call interface ID, or what we would also call the host address, right? But the proper term is ID. The other proper term is these are V6 nodes, right? Because anything on a V6 network that's speaking V6 is effectively a node, unless you're a router, then you're a router, all right? Everything else is a node. Server, client, storage, camera, phones, whatever, they're all nodes, uh, V6 nodes. So the last 64 bits, is all we have to deal with, which still leaves me an address space, 18 billion billion. Remember we went from a four point something billion V4 complete address block to something way, way larger just in my host addressing. But that's actually kind of the good news. I can hide and I can spell words out and don't spell words out, all right? The other thing is a lot of entities will put zero, zero, zero in the fifth, sixth, and seventh hex tet. And in the last hex tet, the eighth one, is they'll use the same addresses that they use for V4, which means they're gonna use basically one to 254. So guess what the bad guys are gonna search on first? They're gonna find your network prefix, first 64 bits done, one fell swoop, easy. Pardon me. The last 64 bits, I'm only gonna search down at the last few bits, one to 254 because we're all creatures of a habit, meaning we wanna make things easy to remember, and why in the world would I give my client that I know is dot 20, dot 3F7A for its client address? I can't remember that by the time I click okay, what that was, all right? I'm gonna give that client colon 20, or colon colon 20, all right? So that's gonna make it an easy, Capability. So we kind of sort of shouldn't do, but guess what people are doing? They're doing what they can quickly understand, what they can quickly blend in together. So again, these are all tidbits of things to know about. Uh, in V6, we have a lot of bits. We have a lot of, uh, of digit fields, all right? Where we have lots of zeros, we have some shorthand capability. I can reduce my contiguous zeros per hextet down to a single zero. I've got what we call leading zero shorthand. All right, so that second hex tet could be reduced to one zero, colon zero. The third hex tet could be reduced. I've got a zero there, a fourth hex tet preceding A52. I can take that zero out and on and on and on. I can further take a grouping of one or more hex tets and reduce it to a double colon. What I cannot do is let's put double colon twice. Because how many bits does the left side double colon equal and how many bits does the right side double colon equal? You cannot derive that from that view. Most, I would not even say it that way. I have not found an operating system that will even allow me to do that, all right? That's kind of one of our very, very few absolutes. So if you ever got a, a IPv6 test question that says, is that a valid representation of an IPv6 GUA, global unicast address? The answer would be no. Don't get hung up on the prefix thing else. If you see two sets of double colons, it's not a V6 address, all right? But in this case, I have two options. I can reduce the, the two double colon groupings or the three double colon groupings, but I can't do both. So you can see option one where we did the first grouping and then the third or the second grouping, we just did uh, dropping of leading zeros or option two, we did it the other way around. The standard says you should use the shorthand that gives you, all right, 
Everyone's considered the shortest. So option two is considered because it makes a quote unquote small you know, smaller number of digits. And it does not matter whether you use it or an operating system uses it. It is totally optional. Some operating systems, you enter it in shorthand, it, it always expands it out. Some you enter it in shorthand and it keeps it shorthand. Some you enter it in longhand and it shortens down. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the operating systems do. They're all three legal representations of the same address. All right, and functional. The other one is, do you use upper or lowercase alpha? The standard recommends lower, but both are allowed and can be mixed. Some operating systems, again, will convert. If you put it in lower, it'll, put, it'll convert into upper. Vice versa, if you put it in upper, it'll convert to lower. Doesn't matter, all right? Doesn't matter when we get to that point. So, uh, de again, depending on the OS, you might see uh, 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 what I call missing bits for the double calling. You just gotta kind of figure out what else you see. A few other little tidbits. Uh, one of the key things in V6, there is no broadcast traffic. So broadcast in V4 is on link type traffic. So I'm trying to find somebody like uh, uh, ARP, right? I'm trying to find somebody who lives, or there's a couple of other types of broadcast traffic. In V6, it's a link or a local multicast, all right? So you, you will have a, a, um, a set of, of specified multicast addresses for on-link and another set of multicast addresses for off-link usage, all right? And um, so anything that you thought of as broadcast traffic is now multicast. Actually makes things a little easier kind of once you get past that. It's, it's hard though to also say things like a V6 world broadcast domain, all right? Because broadcast domain in a V4 world means a couple of things all at one statement. In V6, it's a little bit different. So you have to kind of watch how you use that term now in a V6 world. Um, talked a little bit about global unicast link local. In V6, there is an RFC that defines what we call a unique local address or EULA address. And it is a reserved block of V6 addresses that people can use on their network that are not routable to the outside world. But they are not the same in, I would say, the way we think of, of RFC 1918 addresses, all right? Functional-wise, they're basically the same. You can route your addresses within your domain, all across your domain, all right? But you cannot use a EULA to get off net. It will not well, again, one of those things. And there's there's special reserve block for that as defined in the RFC. Uh, I'm not gonna really do any EULA stuff. Um, there's a lot of discussion out there about use EULA for local, use GUA for off net, and use link local as it, it gets used regardless. And a lot of people forget the EULA address, just use GUA. And everybody weirds out because, oh, but that's a public address. What is the forward facing router or firewall doing anyway? Put the rules in there to block the traffic like we used to do a gazillion years ago before we even had firewalls in a V4 world and no NAT. Um, so there's some basic information. Right now, of all those 340 endocillion possible addresses, the only address block that is used publicly is from 2000 to basically 3FFF. It's represented by 2000 colon colon slash three. That is the only assigned by IANA address blocks that can be used and that will work to the outside. All the rest are reserved. There's a few exceptions. Some of the Fs, there's F is a reserved block for link local prefix. Um, the FC zero zero colon slash seven. Um, uh, F zero zero.
Okay. How about now? Back on? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? They yep, they can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> so you might have noticed I wore my, my Troopers hoodie, right? Trying to get the, trying to get the hacker mode here. I'm a network guy. I'm, I'm a hacker guy. Hacker <laughs> uh, Troopers is a security conference uh, that happens pretty much in every class. And uh, uh, I was presented a couple of times in D6 stuff uh, there. Uh, so we, we had that. Uh, we take down another security conference and then another D6 presentation. All right. So the link local address has the MAC address built in. Everybody said, well, that's not fine. But you gotta remember, this is late 90s, mid late 90s when they came up with this. That's all we had at the time to come up with. <laughs> uh, we came up with a way of using something that's already there, no human intervention of the, the order of the day. So that's where we got it. And nobody liked it. So we have the other way of doing it uh, using this RFC using a random number generator, which is great, right? Random number, woohoo, nobody will figure it out. Except the RFC doesn't say, how do you start from a random number generator? <clears throat> One company based up in Redmond, Washington, <laughs> blinking for those online, can't see me. Uh, guess what they used to start the random number generator from? The MAC address. So it means there's a formula to compute that random number generator, which means that random number can be reversed. It takes, what, three more seconds? For those who know how to do it, jet, a long time, but still. Uh, it's, it's maybe not quite. They also, though, said, not only do we want this random number, we want to create another one using the same basic process. We're going to call this the temporary. The temporary address is defined by the RFC. Should change on a periodic basis, which effectively means I'm going to have a number that you can't track Jeff on. Jeff moves around, Jeff gets a different number. Not only that, while Jeff's on the network, Jeff's temporary number may change. What the RFC doesn't state is how often should temporary be. All right. Uh, Microsoft uses this motive. As long as the interface is active, I'm going to keep that same temporary number for 24 hours. At the end of 24 hours, I'm going to see if it's still good. If it's still good, I'm going to keep it again. I'm going to do it for seven days. After seven days of completely being an active interface, I'll then get a new temporary address. If you turn off the interface, power down the computer, disable the interface, whatever, it'll recompute to a new one. Apple, every hour. It gets a new temporary address. But the good news is it's temporary and it changes. So it's great until you're troubleshooting client server application, bing, 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 pack it, pack it, pack it, pack it, and it's dead. Oh, remember multiple addresses. I can change on the fly. I can keep going. If the traffic is still going client server, you're just not looking at the right interface or, uh, excuse me, the right address anymore. All right. So temporary is great. Most OSs allow you to turn off temporary. Yay. It didn't in the early days. Uh, Microsoft uh, Windows Server does not use a temporary. It's turned off by default. They just use the privacy address. Uh, in fact, Microsoft kind of spearheaded this uh, random number uh, privacy thing, and everybody got on board pretty quick with it. So you have the choice in your operating system. Do you use privacy, or do you use the modified UE64? Hint, Windows, for the most part, uses privacy by default. Uh, Apple switched 10.7, 10.8, maybe. They switched to privacy. Linux, uh, I think now, I think it was six, uh, like uh, Ubuntu 16 something that they switched to privacy as opposed to the UE. Most router vendors, router software, they use the modified UE64, and at times you don't get enough choice. In fact, some of them don't even allow you to statically set that link local address. Um, some do, some don't. But uh, just kind of letting you know, different addresses, all right, different functionality that, that we've seen before. We're going to reference that. How some of this magic works is in V4, an address has two kinds of, li uh, of lives, infinite life or a period of life, a period of time. The period of time is typically from a DHCP server right, in the scope configuration. An infinite is typically a statically assigned. In B6, they added another lifetime timer, and it's called a preferred lifetime and a valid lifetime now. And effectively what happens is as soon as I come on, I get an address, I get two timers. Preferred lifetime means just go. Keep rolling, Jeff. At the end of the preferred lifetime, 
the, the stack will effectively try to either get another address to start using or it'll continue using the same one. It, 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 but it has to ask the question, can I still use it? Let's just say it can't use colon colon 20, all right? But colon colon 20 still has this valid lifetime, which basically is finish up existing comms, but start new comms on colon colon 21. This is how I can have multiple addresses and keep rolling, all right? Because I've got these two timers now. And these are typically adjustable, whether it's in DHCP v6 scopes, or if you're doing the addressing from the router advertisement, uh, we can tune those. And at uh, some client operating systems, you can change the timers from what they were given as well. All right, but typically you would see preferred lifetime is 70% of valid lifetime. And again, it is amazing to see traffic, you know, bang, 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 and it go dead silent. Yeah, the application didn't roll over and die, which is what we expect in a V4 world. Packet stop, ah, there's the problem. It's the server. I'm a network guy. It's never the network. It's the server, all right, or the client. I'm blaming the desktop team, the server team. It is never the network. I don't care what y'all say. I'm the network guy, all right, but. In this case here, it's just because you got to go look at another address. You got to go back to the client, figure out what address it's using, and then start looking at packets on that one. All right. It's just interesting to kind of see some of that stuff happen. Um, if, wait, say again, please. Oh, excellent question. So if I'm using Wireshark to troubleshoot, bing, 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 <laughs> my client server, and my address changes, oops search on the MAC address as your source. MAC address to, it doesn't have to be the MAC address of the destination, right? It could still be IPv6 address of destination, but I'd search on my MAC address because it won't, <laughs> uh, air quotes, air quotes, it, MAC address won't change. I'm sorry, say again? Unless the client's rotating MAC address, and nobody would do that outside of this room. All right, so no, great, Great, great stuff. Great questions. Um, in V4, these things we know about, you know, ARPing and router advertisement that we kind of never see, gratuitous ARPs, the cache, those are all comprised in multiple RFCs. There's about three RFCs that define all those functions. In V6, it's only one RFC, and they're known by a little bit different names now uh, in their operations. We're going to go into a lot more detail of these, and I'm going to pick this pace up a little bit. For the purposes of what we're going to do and see tonight, there's four kinds of ICMP v6 messages that I am going to be paying attention to. Router advertisements. Routers telling me they're online and giving me information. Router solicitations. I'm a, I'm a node. Are there any routers out there is the kind of message I'll send. Neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement. We get to do a lot of stuff. Once I've found you, I want to find out if you're still there. All right. So I would send a neighbor solicitation out. You would send reply back with a neighbor advertisement. All right. Once you start seeing some of this, it, it kind of helps a little bit. Um, so this router solicitation, when I first come online, I'd like to find out, are there any routers? Because they can help me do things. Not only just tell me they are the router for my network, but help me in how I get my addressing. Because how I do my addressing can be controlled from this router advertisement, all right? If I'm statically assigned, I don't need the router advertisement for that other than to find out who my default gateway is. If I've statically assigned everything else. If I'm not statically assigned, uh, I can do, pardon me, I can do functions of what we call stateless address auto configuration. Router, give me my prefix, I'll compute my interface ID. Or I can say, uh, have a router advertisement tell me the node, go ask for a DHCP v6 server to get your address, all right? So the router solicitation has these bits, has these flags that are set, quote unquote, appropriately. There's basically two to four flags that we care about in advertisement. There are more, but there's, there's a few that we really, really care about. I'm gonna show you a lot more about that later on. Uh, I got some pictures. I'm eventually gonna put this stuff up and let Phil know, we'll figure out how to let y'all be able to download a copy of this presentation later. Router advertisement, there's these flags, some of these flags I was talking about, setting how I'm going to tell a client that they can do their addressing. Now here's the key, as a client, as a node, a V6 enabled node on a network, if I get a router advertisement, I am supposed to do what it tells me. This is really, 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 really important to know because in the V4 world, 
if you statically assign an address on a client, does it ask for a DHCP v6 server to get an address from? The hair sees DHCP replies. Does it? In v6, things are different. If you statically assign an address to a v6 client and it gets a router advertisement, does it to go ask a DHCP v6 server for an address? It'll do that. It'll do basically a, a, a multi cast message. If it's on a different subnet, the router will DHCP v6 relay it over to the DHCP v6 server. You got a scope build. Is it? Yeah. Jeff, colon, colon 20. That actually assigned to colon, colon 10. I've got two addresses. Which one of those two addresses will that client use when it needs a routable address? Will it use its static or will it use its DHCP assigned? It will use the DHCP v6 assign, which is not typically the expected behavior from a v4 thinking process. All right. And you probably didn't want this to occur. So you either need to make sure that that flag is not set in the router advertisement or that client doesn't have an address, a statically assigned address. So depending on which side of the house you're on, it's either the server team, router team, or desktop team's fault. All right. The server team, what are they going to say? Not our fault. What's the client team going to say? Uh, we don't think it's our fault. And the router team will say the same thing. Our team, uh, hey, we were told it's a DHCP v6 world. Desktop team, well, we were told it was a static world. All right, cool. The client's got both. That is not an expected result, and it's typically not a desired result. All right, so the, the router advertisement has a lot of power. We always knew the network team was in control. I'm in more control now than ever before. Or I'm more at fault. That's my presentation done. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Yeah, you drop a box that can be, that it doesn't even have to be a router. This is where my security assessment tools, I'm winking, come into play. All I have to do is send out a crafted packet. I can disrupt with a crafted packet. I can man in the middle with a router. Get all the traffic come to me, glean everything that I want, and still ship it out, and nobody knows. Now, hang on half a sec, may I? No, go ahead. So, well, it's a client would see the router advertisement, because a router advertisement is the multicast message. All right, so everybody on that net, on that broadcast domain, that layer two network will see that. How they react to it, well, if they're V6, they should do what the router advertisement tells it, which doesn't matter where they are one second ago. And it, they will forget everything and start with this new. That's where it gets really weird. They may have both, all right? But to follow all of this, there is a, a, a bit of V6 security technology called RA Guard router advertisement guard that most of the router vendors have implemented at this point that effectively you can say, what is my trusted port for the RA? I.e. my uplink port if I'm an edge switch, all right? Any other RAs that come across switch or router firewall, discard. So now I can stop the rogue RAs. However, <laughs> As Andy and I were talking about a little bit earlier, our friend down in Argentina broke that in what, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? Anyway, there's a not very hard way to get past it because of the architecture of V6. All right, there's a, there's a uh, I'm not going to call it a hack, but a fallacy in what's called the, ex private, uh, uh, the extension headers where you can get around it. But generically, that takes a lot of work. Uh, once you know it, most people wouldn't know it. They would just try to throw out a crafted RA or a rogue router, either on purpose or accidentally on the rogue router bid. All right. So there is a protection mechanism, but it's not 100 percent. Broken 
receiving some of the effect. So you're receiving some of it, but you're getting paid a fixed fee, whatever. Could be, yes. Right. I mean, you're skiing or slow down or, you know, hiccups. Or, I mean, there could be some traffic notice. It just depends on how crafty the attack was. All right. If you're just trying to effectively DOS it, that's easy. Right. But if you want to be stealthy, that's going to take a little bit more. And it takes more stuff. Not a lot, necessarily. I mean, AVM will do it. Yes, question. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, what's going through the fire before is going through now. It doesn't matter if there's somebody in the middle. They're looking like what they're supposed to when they send that. Basically, you know, it, it, it comes over here. He sniffs it gleans all the data and then forwards it back as normal nobody knows now what you might see at a firewall if your firewall is even looking at v6 traffic because by default they generally aren't all right so even if they were you got to be looking for maybe high loads or specific kind of loads or something like that but you probably at a generic level would never notice a thing Oh, oh, no, no, agree. Now, if I'm trying to redirect traffic out to glean, of course, but I'm going to, I'm going to, we would not do that kind of stuff. We'd glean it inside the network and always make it look normal going out. Somebody who doesn't quite have that detailed knowledge may just say, oh, I'm going to redirect all the traffic to me in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, you, you may want to, yeah, tunnel some stuff out a different way absolutely i mean that's it's all part of the that part of looking all right and a lot of the i would call it security aspects of v6 don't have a difference of how you look at it and how you approach it all right it's the what you have to do is typically going to be the harder part or the different part of it so yeah the v6 firewall thing uh, they're probably the furthest behind of operating systems of what they do all right to the point of still lacking some of them some of them may forward traffic okay but they don't do any kind of routing v6 routing they may do v4 routing they do v6 routing that's probably one of the weakest things that i have seen over time all right but um so you just have to find out right it could be you just need an update and code but that goes through on everything you right, to, to be able to do it so router advertisements are powerful uh, neighbor solicitation. Now, in a V6 world, before I can, quote, use one of my addresses, I have to basically run the duplicate address detection test, the DAD test, meaning, is this a unique address? All right. In the early days of all this V6 work, it does not matter what V6 address. They all have to pass the DAD. Link locals, GUAs, EULAs, it doesn't matter. Anytime it's considered fresh or new, it's got to pass the DAD, quote, first. Now, sometimes this was taking seconds, and in a real world, seconds would miss the login cycles of some systems in corporate world. So things were failing, all right? By the time the test, the DAD test was complete, and now the operating system can use that address, it's too late. They can't do anything on the network. So the RFC was changed to basically say you can do what's called deterministic DAD. I've got a brand new address. I'm going to do my DAD test and start using it at the same time. What if I find out the DAD test fails? Oops, I was logging into the system. Life was good. And then everything stopped. Because DAD, all right? So um, uh, the, the uh, DAD test attack is fun, all right? And I've got a... I've got a demo on that one as well. Uh, so lots of fun stuff. Uh, neighbor advertisements, I want to find neighbors. Neighbor cache, as effectively, we've got a couple of different states of these addresses that I know about. Uh, not completely unlike V4, but a little bit different. I'm not going to spend much time. This particular chart uh, is one of those, it's worth a lot of money. Thank you for looking at it, and there you go. Will not be in the presentation, I'm just kidding. This basically tells you how do you want to get an address from the router advertisement, which method and which flags have to be set, all right, to get said information. In the early days of Slack, I could basically have the router say, again, give me the network prefix, so ask the client, 
and I will generate my interface ID, put them together, 120 bit address, boom. All right, no, it's DNS and domain name. In the real world today, it means it's worthless, right? Because we don't do anything on addresses, we do everything with address resolution, all right? So DHCP v6 solves that problem. Some people say, well, I don't want DHCP v6, all right? Because DHCP servers does not mean they do both protocols. Windows 2003 DHCP services do not do v6, all right? You got to go to eight and above. And some of the other DHCP uh, server services out there. Uh, so they came up with another one called stateless DHCP v6, which is a hybrid. It uses Slack for the prefix, but then says ask a DHCP v6 server for other information like your domain name, NAS server, uh, time server, download server, blah, 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 blah. But you're not going to get an address from that DHCP v6 server, right? Now, the fun thing about it is when you read all these router documentation, they tell you how to do all these things. They don't tell you what you should turn off and on if you change from the most router OSs or routing OSs is Slack. And you say, well, that's all fine and good, but this is a DHCP v6 or DHCP environment. We're going to do DHCP v6 now. I want to turn on the bits for DHCP v6. Cool. It means you come down here and you turn on the M flag. M stands for managed address, which means somebody else is going to give you everything you need to know. I'm just your router. What they forget to tell you is you want to turn off what's called this A flag, which says auto configuration, which means here's your prefix. You figure the rest out. So you go turn on the M flag and you look at the client and they've got multiple addresses, the DHCP v6 assigned and the Slack address. And you're like going, I didn't tell you to do that. Yeah, you did. You just didn't realize it because the router docs didn't help you. All right. So this is one of those charts. I, I did not understand some of that stuff in the early days. I finally had to build the matrix. And uh, this, this chart been for a long time. There's nothing wrong with even the last one where everything is on and you get a boatload of addresses. Things will still work. That's the great news. You don't know you're in trouble. And you may not even be in any operational trouble. But you're a way in trouble for, from an attack vector viewpoint and potentially from an, what you want to be operational viewpoint. Again, you'll have a temporary address. The temporary address is the GUI that's used. And that may not be what you were thinking. All right. So you have to be careful to look at these flags. We'll see some of this later on. Uh, DHCP process is very similar to V4. We know the DORA acronym. Now it's the SAR acronym. You're told as a client to use a DHCP v6 server. So you send a solicit message. Is there a DHCP v6 server online? It's going to reply with an advertise. Here I am. You say, can I have an address, please? Yes, you may. All right. Solicit, advertise, re request, reply. The SAR, it's fun, it works, life is good. So I've talked about some of these, these security concerns, right? The modified UE64 based on the MAC address, address, it's easy to backwards out. Uh, V6 is on. One of my favorite things to do, especially in a bunch of networking folks, hey, is V6 in your network? And everybody goes, no, 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 we don't run V6. Oh, really? Has anybody done anything to turn it off? And they're like, what do you mean? Uh -huh. Google it. All right. Oh, and by the way, um, uh, now, not by the way, but for the last four-ish years, Microsoft has reversed themselves about turning off v6 if you don't want it. They've now built in v6 as part of the operations of some of their server services. It doesn't mean it's going to get used, but it has to be enabled at the server and the client. All right. So everybody was turning it off. And, oh, and by the way, if you think in Microsoft Windows by unticking the box where it says v6 protocol in the network interface, you've turned it off. <laughs> you haven't. You just think you have. It kind of gives you that forward facing look that you have. It's still there. You actually have to go do a reg edit. Microsoft gave you that. They tell you now, don't, don't do that anymore. Don't turn off v6. You're going to need it. All right. So uh, a lot of about V6 is people are running it and they don't even know it. Yes, I've got a gr great demo that I've done a few times where I log in through a public facing device on a real public V4 address. <clears throat> it turned out to be a Windows 2008 server. I hack into it. There, I run a few tools. Oh, Wireshark is one of them. There's no V6 running. And I now start recon the network on V6 because who's watching me? Nobody. Who's watching V4? Looking for, you know, sequential. Yeah, there's the potential for people watching V4 bad traffic. Whether they are or not, that's 
a different story. But they're probably not one. And even if they are running V6, guess what they're probably also still not doing? Watching V6 traffic. So running an in-map scan on V6, this is still the same in-map kind of scan of V4. It's just looking at a different address. But it will not be seen by the IDS IPS that's watching for V4. I'll call it in-map traffic. It's probably not the right target, but you get what I'm talking about, a scan. All right, so we got to be a little careful of that. The RA, we talked a lot about that. We can do a lot of damage with the RA, lots of threats to the network. I'm hoping, after all of the things I've talked about, you've already started formulating. Woo -hoo! Guess what I'm going to do in my lab? Yeah. Wait, what do I use to look for that stuff? All right, there's a couple of different attack vectors. We've talked about most of these, and there's mitigation. One of the things is somebody said, well, fine, I'll just turn off ICMPv6 on my router. Can't do that. That protocol is used for all the integral operations of v6. You can turn off a few of the ancillary things, but for the most part, you can't turn off the core ICMP v6 ports. Things will not work. Not, I don't want them. It doesn't matter, right? It's just not going to work correctly. So we have to be a little careful with that. Uh, so there's the attacks. Um, network scanning, I talked a little bit about this a while ago. Don't use hex words in your addresses. No matter how cute it looks. Oh, look, I, I can use like, you know, C5C0 for Cisco. I can use the Facebook. I can, this is my company letters in heck. Won't everybody be impressed? Yes, says the bad guys. They're impressed that you made life so easy because you've just shortened the attack vector because that's what they're going to look for first. So in the lab, fine. Uh, all the good stuff about that. All right, there's ways to do it. I'm going to do a quick thing on Wireshark. All right, one of the things I want to kind of show in this viewpoint of Wireshark, build some color rules in Wireshark for specific V6 traffic. If you're not using color rules in your Wireshark, you're doing yourself a potential disfavor. I'm not going to say bad thing. Some folks don't like colors and turn it off. Some people don't see the same colors the same way. I get that. I understand that, but find whether it's colors or grayscaling or whatever, but tune your V6 traffic different from your V4 traffic, all right? Especially if you're watching live traces. That stuff is flying past. For me, that kind of orangish red is my router advertisements. The pink is my router solicitations, all right? The bright yellow is ICMP V6 traffic. The pale blue is ICMP V4 traffic, all right? So I could quickly look at some of this traffic or some other V6 traffic that's pale blue, and I can see things like I expect router advertisements on a subnet on a periodic basis. I expect to see router solicitations as nodes are coming online, all right, or in the interface enabling. And I can see it that quick. Okay, good. All right. I don't need to sit there and, you know, look at that thing until I'm blue in the face, all right? Whether you use my colors or anybody's color, it doesn't matter. Just help yourself. Um, I'll look at the color rules in Wireshark. The default color rule for ICMP includes both V4 and V6 ICMP traffic. Drove me crazy. So I created a filter. In the older days of uh, some of the older versions of Wireshark, it put new color rules at the bottom. Color rules are processed like ACLs and firewall rules, top down. So you have to move a, couldn't figure that out. Nothing told me that. Move that color rule up. Now they come up from the top down first. But I created one for ICMP v6 traffic to come up first. All right, and I have a few others up there in the color rules. Uh, build a color rule. Uh, display filters, if you're not using display filters, another potential uh, help for you, all right? If you're looking at tra v6 traffic, do you care about v4 traffic? Possibly not. There's a built-in dis display filter in Wireshark, IPv6. Filters out everything but IPv6. All IPv6 traffic is now visible, all right? So you're going to cut out a lot of that other stuff. And you can get into more details of uh, uh, display filters to help narrow down what you're looking at. We're looking for needles in the haystack. Wouldn't it be great to be able to take big chunks of the haystack out of the way knowing the needle's not there, all right? And then we keep drilling down. So display filters will help. I'm going to be using them. All kinds of display filters. Uh, more information about that. And display filters, you have to kind of know the crafting. You know, where are you looking in the packet? What bits, what section? In a trace, you can select the packet. Go down to the device de or the packet details. Go to that particular area that you're interested in. Say you want to find router or neighbor solicitation messages. I can uh, highlight that packet, right click, and select apply as filter, say selected, and that'll pop that up into my display filter and implement it right then. So if I'm looking for a particular source, let's say, or destination or whatever, or just that type of traffic, 
right? Builds me a quick filter. And I didn't have to know it was ICMPv6 dot type space equal equal uh, 135 or 136 or 134, whichever type of traffic I want. In this case, 135. So Wireshark helps you build this stuff. I think to know all the details, the, the, the deep details about it. Uh, columns are handy. I might be able to show a, a description, but there may be other information within a packet that if you saw all of them, it would be handy. Router advertisements, remember those flags? So there's basically four flags in a router advertisement that we pretty much manipulate. I've got a special, what I'm gonna come to in a second, profile that has extra columns that show just the router advertisement flags and how they're set. And so I see the router advertisement, I see the flag setting, and I can pick out, uh, that's not mine, that's why we're having problems. And effectively within you know, a few minutes of a capture, maybe less, maybe more, I might be able to ascertain what's going on, i.e. a rogue router. Whether it was an on purpose or an accident, we don't care at this stage of the game. But I can look for only uh, router advertisements and I'm looking for the flag settings. Uh, profiles is a way to build your look. All right, you're typically troubleshooting or looking for certain kinds of packets, certain traffic. These profiles will help bring your Wireshark view dialed into what you want. Certain columns, certain display filters, certain colors, certain other base configurations of Wireshark. And these uh, profile definitions are portable, all right? They're in subdirectories, very easy to get to. You just put them up on the shared drive, tell everybody in the team, here, go get these display filters. Go up to Andy's cellstream.com website for his display filter uh, library, all right? There's lots of uh, display filter uh, uh, profiles that include the display filters sometimes. But these profiles, you can maybe see, I've got some for V6, I've got OpenFlow, uh, I had some for some other projects, and, and on and on and on. So all this helps you use your wash effectively. Packet comments, last little thing, if you're getting a trace for whatever, and you're gonna keep that trace, you might wanna make notes. How many get traces and make the notes on a piece of paper off of the side, and then somehow they never get together. Oh wait, maybe you're better than me, and you make them in some sort of uh, note program, you know, Evernote or something like that, and then you put the trace file with the Evernote, right? I got it together. Why not just put the comments in the trace file? right click on a packet in the details and basically add a comment all right and put data in there like oh this is the good thing or this is the bad thing or whatever this is my favorite server team it's your fault here's why go build a display filter on packet comments and this will tell you here's where you're doing it wrong in your application or applications team or desktop team and, and then you have to add the little snide comments not the network fault but that's because i'm a network guy all right last bits let's talk about some of this hacking are we ready have a lot less time to show a whole lot of stuff. So I've got a, uh, a fairly big network, different cloud OSs. Um, I'm using a Windows 2008 server for DCPv6. I've got a VOS open source router for my v6 routing. Uh, actually I actually have a couple more subnets, so I probably won't have time to bring up. And then I have a couple of my attack boxes. <laughs> All right, I've got an attack router. I have uh, an Ubuntu uh, with a couple of these uh, security tools. And then I also have Kali Linux, which has, well, a lot. It actually has some of the V6 tools in it. Not all of them, but some of them. Got one of them. It's got my particular favorite, and it's easy to get the rest of them in there. So my last little bit, of course, my disclaimer, right? Jeff did not tell you to do this when you weren't supposed to be doing it. Sorry. I want somebody to get a hold of this. Hey, Jeff, girl said to do this. I'm just showing you things that are possible on a closed environment right here on Jeff's world. All right. So there we have it. The, tools, the two top V6 tools are the Hacker's Choice IPv6 and the SI6 toolkit. All right. Uh, if you basically search on V6 attack or V6 hacking tools, you'll find links to those. Uh, they've both been around probably almost the longest of any others. Uh, they each have their specific, uh, or specific uh, um, uh, I'm not going to say functions, they both do basically the same, but one's a little easier than the other, half sec. The, the Hacker's Choice Kit uh, has a lot more, quote, tools listing. They're individual tools for very specific things. The SI6 Toolkit has, quote, fewer tools, but for each tool, it does anything and everything from a kind of a packet crafting viewpoint. Not exactly like a scappy or scapey, however you want to pronounce that, packet crafter. 
all right? But it's a similar type of analogy. Uh, the hacker's choice I find a little bit easier to start with, and the SS6 tools when I want to get down to the nitty gritty and do some really interesting things. Yes, sir, question. If you're just wanting to find a, a, an address block, or I want to scan a subnet. Remember how big is the subnet? 18 billion billion addresses. Sure, you can scan a dual slash four network. I think the latest I've heard is upwards of 50 years, maybe less by now, maybe less, you know half of that with big honking lots of you know computer farms to do it. Uh, generically, you're not going to scan a V6 subnet generically. All right, you're going to probably scan a very small subset of it, or you can look for certain things. Yeah, but uh, InMap is more optimized uh, of the tools. I don't honestly know about all the tools or any of the other tools, really. Um, kind of my listing here is pretty much what I've done. Uh, there's another uh, tool, uh, Chiron, uh, that actually uses Scappy underneath or Scapy underneath to uh, do it. Very, very sophisticated crafting type tool. Uh, SI6 is a little bit less, but still extremely capable. Uh, so those are the tools. I'm going to be using a couple of those tools. And so again. Oh, 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 sorry. Yes. I don't know. I, I just don't. I, I'm, I'm not into that part of it. So I don't know how all that kind of stuff works. I, I just don't. I don't have a clue. So again. Of course, um, so yeah, something I need to learn. I think I, I tweeted out today a, a hashtag a hacker wannabe. That would be Jeff, right? I, I discovered about ten or so years ago. I'm not wired correctly to do some of this kind of stuff, but I think I know enough to be slightly dangerous in my world, and enough to be able to talk to y'all and everybody figure out. Oh, okay, I got it now, right? Without having the real details. I'm hoping that will be the case. All right, but I don't know. I just don't know about that part. But it's a great question about that functionality. Um, real quick, and then I'm going to move into demo. If I look at this uh, Windows 10 client, I've got an IPv6 address. Uh, 2001 DB8 is a prefix that is used. Uh, it's a reserved prefix for, quote, documentation and demonstration and lab purposes. All right, it's not routable on the public Internet, but it is completely routable within a domain. All right, so everything I'm going to have uh, to show is going to be 2001 DB8 something. The third and fourth hextet, I've got different permeations, and then everything else after that is the client address. So you see a couple in here, lab base and 74C, which stands for the hacker's choice. Too bad. All right, this is probably not a good address. It's just not. All right. Uh, even down in DNS, I've got lab base colon colon 2000 and the too bad colon colon 53. Well, the too bad was the dead giveaway. I just thought calling colon 53 for the DNS would be fun as well. All right. But anyway, so the good news is these addresses are completely workable. I can be doing real traffic with those. But if my world was only supposed to be lab base and I see anything else, oops, what's going on? And at some point in time, things like DNS queries are probably going to go to the wrong DNS. You know, it could be a DNS spoofer. Could be doing real DNS resolution. I just may not want them to know where all I'm going, right? And on and on and on. I may have some routable traffic, right? Remember, temporary address. Now I'm going to go to this guy. When I didn't have that temporary address before, I was going to this guy's router. And my gateways, FE80, is the reserve block, reserve pre and local address. So anytime you see an FE80, it is considered a self-derived address, whether it used the UE64, or the privacy extension, some router operating systems allow you to statically enter the link local address, like FE80 colon colon 254, or FE80 colon colon 1. Guess what that is? Probably a router matching the dot one or the dot 254, the V4 router address. Don't do that, right? Well, I'm telling it to people who would build networks. Don't do that. To us, yes, 
that just made my life significantly easier because I can find that information really quick. All right, on to the demo. I think I've got to share a different screen here. And share. All right. So uh, what I've got on this basic network, I've got Wireshark on right now. It's the only uh, system on, um, on this particular network, uh, save for my local client. I've got a virtual network. If I could actually type things in correctly, and it is VMNet 9, okay? So that is on this same subnet right now. All it has is a link local address, if you could see this. I don't have any other routable addresses at the moment. So the first thing I'm going to fire up in my virtual world here is my 2008, or excuse me, 2012 router. Uh, my 2012, I can't even talk. I'm going to fire up the server. That makes it a lot easier. And he's also providing DHCP v6 services. All right. While this guy is coming online, I'm going to go back to watching uh, Wireshark because I want to watch. And uh, look at that. There's a router solicitation. Woohoo! That means somebody came online. It's probably the first box that we just saw, the server. So one of the things I'm going to do right off the bat here is I'm going to filter out for IPv6 traffic. I'm going to make this a little bit easier. And I start to see when a V6 enabled device comes online, it'll first kind of basically generate its link local, and then it will send out a router citation. And it'll send out three of those by default pretty quick in succession. Any routers out there? Any routers out there? Hello, any routers out there? Eh, not hearing any routers. Life is good. There's another message I want you to pay attention to, a DHCP V6 solicit. All right, wait a minute. I got quite a few solicit messages right around here. Now you're supposed to say, but Jeff, you said the only time a device would do a DHCP v6 request or a solicit is when it's told to by the router advertisement. Didn't I just say that a little bit ago? Somebody said yes. Yes. You gotta believe I did. I did, truly. All right. I didn't tell anybody to go ask for a router. Well, guess what Microsoft does? They come online if there's no static address in their v6 configuration then the other radio button is set to automatically get one they basically in my humble opinion ported their code from v4 to v6 and automatically do a solicit message all the microsoft operating systems since vista do that server and client so wait a minute why is this server doing a solicit message because it's the way the code's written didn't matter that the router Woohoo! this is going to be interesting stuff for later, right? Knowing uh, Linux doesn't do this, Mac OS doesn't do this. Thank you, Microsoft. All right, knowing this is useful, even to the point of if I come over here, whoops, not that, to the server and fire up, up his UP service and dial in the view here of the DHCP v6 services. And look at the DHCP server and, and, and trying to move things while the VMs are all loading. Uh, go down here to the V6 world to this particular scope. But I look at the address leases and looky there. This guy is the server has a DHCP V6 assigned address because he asked for a server. Are you there? Well, yes, he was there. Can I have an address? Oh, sure. Here, you're one from the pool. Thank you very much. Even to the point, if we come over here and look and do an IP config, and you'll see statically, maybe you can, he statically assigned a colon colon 2000 and he has a colon colon 100. Life is good. Well, you're supposed to say, really? Well, what about that client over there, Jeff? What's he doing? Well, this client that was sitting over here, go down to VMNet 9. Well, he hasn't done anything, still has his link local because he's already been up. He long ago asked his question. Guess what? If you take that interface and, oh, that is not what I wanted. And you uh, bring down VMNet 9, change, thank you. 
come down to VMNet 9. If I do a disable on it, and then I do an enable on it, come on, thank you. And I quickly jump over to Wireshark, if I can quickly, come on. You know, everything always moves faster when you're not going to show it. And now I'm all tied up. Come on. There we go. Uh, Wireshark, Wireshark, where are you? And, well, there's a rattle solicitation. That's the one we were looking at a while ago. Uh, let's bump this up a little bit. And, uh, oh, oh, A192, I happen to know that's my last two bytes of my MAC address of that client. He was sending out router solicitations, so he kind of knew online, probably somewhere in there, he would have, so there's a request and reply, solicit advertise, so if I pop back over to my client, I look at VMNet 9, I'm going to find out that he now has a lab base address I have no router on the network. This is not something that I'm going to call it wrong. It's the behavior of the OSs. All right. I don't like it, but it's not wrong because the RFCs don't address this. All right. Like all the rest of the standards, there are some ambiguities. And the developers, they took it the way they wanted. So now, the cool thing about this is, if you also remember a while ago, I said you could not ping a GUA address without a router. Who remembers that? Come on, just say yes. This is in Texas. Nod your head every so often, right? The horse mode. Just nod your head every so often. Makes me think you're you're you got it. All right. One base, colon, colon, lab base 2000. 2000 is my server. I try to ping it. I get a failure. Wait a minute. I know that server sitting at colon, colon, 2000. <gasps> Wait, it had another address, right? Colon, colon, 100. 100. Still can't ping it. This is not the way V4 works. Static addresses ping each other done. Who, who can use this router? V6, my router's not there. Can't ping it. I could ping its link local, all right, because we're on the same net but I cannot ping, it's statically assigned, or in this case, even it's DHCP v6 assigned address because I've got no router of reference to know that I could do that, all right? So uh, this, I'm not gonna call it a, uh, uh, maybe an attack vector, this is an operational, oops, I need a router. All right, so let's fire up a router. Uh, next box. So we're gonna fire up this router and we're going to go back into Wireshark, and I am going to run a display filter, if it will come up, that looks for just router advertisements, router solicitations, and DHCPv6 traffic. So what should happen when that router comes alive, he'll send out three router advertisements, bang, bang, bang. I'm a router, and here's my flag set accordingly. And if there's anybody out there listening, they'll take action. And uh, they won't do a router solicitation message because they already heard the router. They don't need to find out if the router, they've already been there. They will immediately do whatever's been said. And if you see this router advertisement in red, and now you see a confirm and reply, and it's A192, that happens to be my client. He just asked for a, a, an address. The server up here replied with an address. So now if I come back over here to my client and and, and I look at the right command again, and I go look at VMNet 9. VMNet 9 actually now has another address assigned from the DHCPv6 server because the router advertisement told it to. Now, another thing that Microsoft will sometimes do in the OS, uh, in the client, it will write that a DHCP assigned, a DHCPv6 assigned address to soft registry, which means it will ask for it again, as long as that interface is still alive. It will always ask for that same address. Can I still have it? When the timers have expired. All of my timers are all very, very short, minutes for a demonstration purpose, as opposed to defaults, which could be hours and days, all right? So I'm gonna see a lot of traffic in this relation only because of my demo, all right? Say again, please. 
Well, you know, actually, I don't remember now, as I said all that, what the address was before. Uh, there was, wasn't, uh, it was 107 before. So really, all he did was ask for a server and then basically make the request for 107 again. And the server said, yeah, nobody else has got it but you, so yeah, you can keep using it is effectively. But I, I, um, um, I could have been crafty and changed that from my DHCP server viewpoint. Say again. Oh, this. Is there a way to do the desktop share? OK. Zoom. Oh, sure. Uh, wait, a little bit under advanced. Portion of screen, nope. I don't see a desktop. I'll try not to go to there too many times. Oh, wait, screen? No, screen's what we're showing. Yeah, there's not a. OK, wow, that's interesting. Wait, what if we do screen and share? Maybe that's what we should have been doing. How about now, when it, when it comes live? OK, sorry, online folks. OK, so the key was the DCP server came alive. If anybody asked for it, it was happy to give information. The router comes online, starts telling people what to do, and they do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hang on. Somebody's talking. I'm sorry. I can't hear. I thought I heard. Yeah. What, what could be wrong with this picture? So says the bad guys. Actually, these are the things I tell folks in the lab. You know, when you're initially building up V6, you want to test what you expect to run. Awesome, great, now throw things at it and see what's gonna happen. Every brand and flavor and version and service pack XXX reacts sometimes differently, all right? Windows 10 1803 does not act the same as Windows 10 1810 or 1809. I found something two days ago about that. I did not see what I expected, yet it was supposed to have changed in 17 something, all right? But I did not do an extensive testing by firing up a bunch of 1803s. All right, but the bottom line is, this is what I tell folks in a, in a real production mode before you ever get there, you really need to do a lot of testing. And then you need to throw stuff at it, kind of like what I'm going to be doing tonight. So um, there's all kinds of things that just happen. You know, if I start firing up new clients, which I want to do, then and go back into Wireshark. Traffic starts, router advertisements are flying. People ask for routers. Yeah, I'm a router. Here's the bits. Go. And things will happen. And it's all in the background. All right. Uh, most of the configurations that I'm running are all what you'd be considered out of the box. Fire up the operating system. All my clients are plain vanilla configs. All right. Except for my tackers, except for my server. But my true clients, endpoint clients, are pretty much uh, generic. Me. See a router solicitation, E337, that's his new client. Did a SAR, got an address. You know, if I pop over to that screen, he'll have life is good. IP config. And we see lab base 104. If I pop over to the server and I click in there and I look at his address table, we start to see it's populating. We're seeing clients come online. It's doing its job. Things are working as expected right now. That's the key. I want to fire up uh, my Linux client right quick, just so you can kind of see. I want to go back into Wireshark, all right? From a, a foundation V6 operation, everything will follow the same basic operation, again, based on the config that I have. I have a DHCP V6 server. It will reply when asked. Doesn't matter how it was asked. It doesn't matter who asked, all right? It will just reply. Yeah, you want an address? Sure. Uh, here's an unused one. Go. And here's all the other things you need to know. Your DNS, your domain name. No default gateway, right? V6 gets that from that router advertisement. Well, that's how the clients get it in V6. So uh, we see another client just popped up. Uh, 590 Echo. So that's that Ubuntu client. If I click over to him and log in. And, and 
we wait. My machine is slowing down a bit. I've got a quad core with 32 gig, but I usually can have a lot. But part of it is we're going outside and I have issues with that. Okay, so if I do a quick IF config, and in my particular case, if I do on uh, ENS33, um, might be able to see in here, it's a little hard, I know. I've got a colon colon 109 address that I got from the DHCP v6 server because the router advertisement told me on and on and on. Okay, I'm gonna fire up one more client for it to get going. So everything effectively is working as expected to this part. Things are getting addresses. Right now, I haven't, quote, done any, I'm going to call it attacking, all right? This is production. So everybody's like, where's the fun stuff? And I got how many minutes? Okay, if I ask nine, who can stay? I know we get run out about 10, so somewhere about 9.30, I'm thinking. If you can stay, stay. If you can't, that's fine. We're recording. So you might be able to come back and watch the last little bit because I'm, as they say, finally get into the good stuff. I'm hoping you feel the early stuff was worthwhile because now when we get to this, I can, I can quote unquote bounce through it, right? And you'll go, oh, that's right, that's yeah, yeah, cool. And then if not, we'll watch the video. All right, so things are happening. Another client came online, life is good. Why is he saying this? It's time. I have another router attacker coming online. So what is fun about this is to watch it from a Wireshark perspective, a packet perspective, see what's happened. What color of packets do you think are gonna start popping up? Say again? Black. <laughs> no, more red. Router advertisements, router advertisements to me, not routers from, but I could do colors. Oh, that's cool, I hadn't thought about that. I could do router advertisement from the attacker as black, but that would be no fun because that's not what I might see in the real world. Right, because I need to know some specifics about that attacker. Right now, I'm looking for um, a out router that's coming online and make sure um, that we are looking. So 957B is my valid router. Oh, no, router advertisement 9480 just popped up. I'm starting to see some release replies, which is DCP traffic from a client. And if I let this run maybe just a few more minutes, we'll start to see, oh, another 9480. I've got these things going in really short times. A window of like, um, I don't know, a couple of seconds to 10 seconds. Basically, I'm banging the wire with bad router advertisements so that I get the maximum effect of hitting all my clients. Because a router advertisement that a client sees, the client is supposed to do what it's told. Not, wait a minute, I've got an address that's good for the rest of the day. Too bad. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do what a router advertisement tells you. What happens if I see 10 router advertisements a second apart with 10 different configurations? Better be doing what you're told to do. That's what is supposed to be going on. Now, what's even more fun, I've got a, a, a couple of a, attack router advertisements and a good one. So these clients are starting to flip around, all right? Now, I made a comment a while ago about some of these profiles, and I've got one for IPv6 columns. And real quickly, I can see M flag and A flag. The M flag says, go ask a DCP v6 server. The A flag says, here's your network prefix. The, pardon me, the good router has the M on and A off. The bad router has the M off and the A on, the exact opposite. So if I were to quickly look into one of these router advertisements that's bad, and I go down here, I start to see a prefix 2001 DBA 200 colon bad. Too bad. Awesome. With this, right? It is a lab after all. So if I just come over here to, uh oh, what did I click? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm okay. Um, actually, let me do it this way. Let go. I have something flashing. No, maybe it's all right. Um, come on. Your internet connection's unstable. Yeah, how about that? 
Uh, let's come over here to, I'll say this Windows 7 client. If I look at this client, I see he still has a lab base address. He's got a pair of the two bads. Uh, he's got two default gateways. Now, if I would go look at the, the more details of some of the flags of the bad router advertisement, I would see things like it's got its priority set too high, so it would be the more preferred router to use. It, it's got the two badges, so it's going to start sending its traffic that's supposed to be routed to that default uh, uh, attack router. Um, I think I may even have, if I look at this, uh, IP config all more and look and see what DHCPs I have. Um, uh, DNS server as well. I'm still resolving DNS to my good DNS box. That's kind of an okay thing right now. Uh, however, I want to show something else. This uh, Windows 10 client, IP, conf IP config. Uh, pick color and more, and oh, uh, Windows 10. Oh, come on, really? I want to show you this. Okay, same kind of thing. He's got a D drive address. He's got his two bad addresses. Uh, he's still sending stuff to the correct DNS. So effectively, these boxes are going to take these addresses. I can run another command. Uh, and find out how long do these addresses live for. Uh, interface IPv6, show adder interface equal, um, it's my interface, 12. And I find out that some of my addresses are going to be good for two minutes. Um, my, my GUA address, um, oh, look. He's good for 14 minutes. So my DHCP drive addresses have a longer lifetime than my attack addresses. And that's probably the way I would think of it from an attack viewpoint. I want my addresses to potentially change more frequently. And maybe I don't, all right, just depends. But in my particular case, I've got these settings. So by simply invoking a router on this network with an incon uh, a misconfigured environment, yeah, misconfigured would be the lab test version of the you know, the rogue router would be the bad guy version of it. And oh wait, we're in bad guy mode right now. So my 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 router this piss, you know, it has done this. That's all I've done. Right? I haven't done anything else on the network except drop a box on there and let it broad whoops, can't say that. Let it on link multicast the message out, the RAs. Yeah, you got to drop that word broadcast. See how long I've been doing it? And I still bring it in there. Oh, by the way, when you start playing with V6 addresses, guess how many times they'll come out? 2001.dv8.lab. Oh, and it doesn't work. So you'll do colons. And then in your V4 addresses, 10 colon 1 colon 0 colon 10. And a favorite, you'll mix them in both addresses. It's a thing. It just happens. As they say, you got to get used to it. Right? You have, to, you have to switch the thing. But that's okay. There's been, um, I think it was England, uh, IPv6 Buddy, a little USB side keypad. It's a hex keypad with a colon, single character, double colon button. Um, it's actually kind of cool in the early days. I, after a few months, I was better at just typing it. Yeah, but I was getting used to it. All right. But it's a fun little widget uh, at the beginning. So I dropped the attack racker, uh, the attack router. He did its job. And as they say, it was very easy to do, and he's still out there rolling along. So, um, yeah, those are the things that can happen. So we don't have to have, quote, an attacking tool in this particular, this one particular scenario. I can use a router as the attacking tool. And actually, depending on X variables, sometimes that's the better thing, especially if you know the make and model, or at least the make, the, the vendor, based on the MAC address of what's already in. Fire up one, change the MAC prefix of that device to match the Cisco or the Juniper or the HP or the whatever brand of routers in place so that even that looks like it's valid and misconfigured when it's actually the attack, all right? That's where we've got to start sneaky, okay? 
we're trying to try to hide the tracks very, very well. But I didn't need a tool at this stage of the game to do this. But I have done, I would say, maybe exactly what I want. I've got multiple addresses. I can redirect traffic to me, potentially have that router, send it back out wherever it's destined in normal mode. And life is okay. All right. So I'm going to go turn off that attack router. Uh, because we've done his job. All right, so that guy's off. Um, I want to bring up a another attack box. So I'm just going to bring up a little uh, Ubuntu box here that I have copied some of my tools to, right? Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to uh, show a couple of the uh, the hacker's choice uh, tools. So it's the same kind of, of process in the thinking of the attack, right? What do I want to do? If I just want to evoke uh, a little bit of grief or I want to evoke a redirection of traffic, I can do the same thing. Oh, um, Ubuntu box. Got to get the same credentials in there, the correct credentials. All right. Somewhere in here, I thought I had, I think. Oh, it's going to take me much longer. Forget that. All right, we're going to do a um, same thing with a router. Fake router six, E zero minus A, and I'll Talk you, I'll talk for a second. That uh, again, uh, lab seven four. Oh, my bad. Seven four C. I could do anything, but I want it to be this way. Uh, too bad. I really. Okay, so what I'm going to do with this particular tool, I'm going to use what's called the fake router six, which effectively says send a router advertisement. I want the uh, um, uh, router advertisement to have the A flag on, which tells the clients use the network prefix of 2001 DBA 74C, too bad. And I want you to have a lifetime of 180 seconds. And I want you to also glean out of here a DNS configuration. So you might remember in my earlier talks that the original Slack definition would give a um, client capability of here's your network prefix, figure out your host ID, but no DNS type stuff, no DNS uh, server or domain name. They, they uh, uh, the industry basically uh, changed that behavior to say, all right, in a router advertisement, let's also add a DNS server IP address, IPv6 address, and a domain name. But guess what? It's not considered a must. It's a consumption. And so therefore, not everybody across all the operating systems has yet to implement it. Not all router vendors, not all server vendors, not all client vendors, not all spiral vendors, on and on and on. All right. Most of the router vendors have implemented those, those particular fields. In this case, this VOS router, um, I can give the, domain, uh, the, the DNS address, but not the domain. I can only give it part of the puzzle. Um, in the case of Windows, uh, it wasn't until uh, Windows 10, 17 something that they would recognize that field in a router advertisement. And on my 18.03, it doesn't, but my uh, 9 it does. So uh, again, some of the um, um, options that you might want to use in a test may or may not be available for clients to pick up on. All right, but in my particular case, I'm going to be sending out these router advertisements. Remember, I still have my real router going, right? This is adding in yet another router. Well, actually, this is my crafted um, uh, RAs. And it appears that I have a typo. That never happens. 
eighth? Why? Oh, really? I must have something wrong in there. Oh, I can't believe this. As they say, um, um, all right, so hang on just a minute. Let me, let me go look. Fake DCP, where's my fake? Oh, maybe I don't need that. It's going to be one of those days. Um, oh, I'm sorry, folks. Thought I had this all sequenced up, up the way. Apparently not. But that's why we make notes. You know what it is? The flags uh, ordering. Uh, oh, wrong. I just fired up something else that I didn't want. Oh. Should be. Let me just try it this way. Oh, I really want that flag. Okay, well, I've got one going finally. It's not going to be exactly what I wanted. But the bottom I now have this router advertisement going out. If I were to look at its set it, see the 74C too bad. I could actually see the uh, uh, recursive DNS server, that DNS server that I had configured, the uh, setting in there, and the prefix information field. And life would be good. If I come over and look at, say, the Windows 10 client, I should start to see, this is where it sometimes takes an extra couple of minutes. I still have uh, some of the other ones are in my, into my too bad. I'm into my, um, I think I'm into my too bad. Where'd my tech go? Yeah, 74C, too bad. Hadn't picked up the, the DNS yet. But that's okay. But the bottom line is before he had a different address. So now we're using effectively a crafted packet with the tool. All right. He's sending out specific information. Uh, and the other bit that, that I may be able to show here. Look at the, uh, uh, the timers are like days, days worth of time, of value, not m minutes, you know, a few minutes here and there. So addresses are going to stay until I bring down that interface effectively, or that time expires. Oh, guess what? Every time it hears an RA, and the A flag is set for the address auto configuration, and it has a timer value, the timer's reset to beginning again because it's supposed to do what it's told. 
Now, this is very interesting. The different operating systems will act differently. Apple OS used to say, thank you very much. I get it, but I still got life left over here. I'm keeping this one. Microsoft said, oh, there's the time. Reset the clock. But in Windows 10, and especially the later versions after the creator update, basically the 17, whatever, I forget that number, they've been tweaking their v6 operator. Um, I'm going to say they're tweaking. They're different. Some of them are a little bit different. Not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, just different. Okay. So it, it's not even one of those things to say, well, this is how Windows 10 operates. No. Which version? This is how Windows 7 operates. Depends on which service pack and or add-on they had a, not only did you kind of really need Windows 7 service pack one to get the better V6 operations, they had an additional V6, V6 update that made it a little bit better yet, all right? Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, Windows 8 acted a little bit different than Windows 8.1. Windows 10, acted, it just keeps on growing. So from the, I would call it attack viewpoint, if you don't know those little bit of nuances, you may not get what you're trying to achieve, right? Uh, oh, wait, we're not attacking, we're testing. Yeah, yeah, you're not going to get what test what you're looking for, all right? So, again, this is just a particular attack uh, using, the, in this case, the Hacker's Choice uh, IPv6 toolkit. Uh, and one, one of those tests. Uh, so, one of the other tests that I'll show then with that attacker We'll stop it. It's I've got a uh, maybe it'll work this one. Was is it a DHCP v6? Uh, yeah, DHCP type attack. Where'd he go? Ah, thank. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do is fire up a, a, a DHCP v6 attack. So what that means is every time a router advertisement comes along with the M flag set, which tells the clients, go ask a DHCP v6 a server, All right? It's a multicast message. Are there any DHCP v6 servers out there? All of them that are on net or any router interface that's forwarding DHCP requests to another net, all those things will happen. However many DHCP v6 servers can reply will. So guess what? I'll get multiple replies. And then I effectively will ask one of them, can I have an address? Which one do I ask? Will somebody ask? Thank you. Which, which one will give me the address? Well, I can also have settings in my DHCP v6 server values as to priority levels, all right? Well, most of the time they're kind of set at, you know, like a medium level as a default. My attacker is gonna be set to a higher priority. So I'm gonna now say, well, thank you, this list of DHCP v6 server that get advertised back to me, or uh, excuse me, yeah, advertise you're there. This is the one I want an address from, all right? And it will effectively, hopefully, get that address because it asked for one, the server should reply with one. And so I'm sending out a, uh, a packet to say my um, uh, network mix, uh, that I'm gonna use for my DHCP pool is 2001 DBA uh, 74C bad one. The router was sending out network uh, prefixes of too bad, All right? So we'll start to see uh, fake DHCP requests heading out there, or uh, D, uh, DHCP replies. Um, and this is one we'll have to spend a few minutes. Now, I can bounce this, and I probably should, by uh, – oh, everybody knows about IP config release renew, right? generically says, give me a new V4 address. There's an IPv6, release six, renew six. And it's not always workable. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, all right? I'm not gonna say there's any rhyme or reason to it, 
my experience is I just don't really use it. I really want to have an interface kind of like start over, just disable it and enable it. Now, uh, from a lab testing perspective, that also, of course, clears out all those timers and everything else. Uh, however, from a um, attacking perspective, well, we're probably not doing that, but that's all okay. So we'll come back over here to Wireshark. And hopefully, we start to see um, there's a router solicitation, a router advertisement. Uh, he uh, asked his own DHCPv6 server for uh, an address, and then he effectively asked the other one that's sending out bad information for an address. And if we come over here and look on that Windows 10 client, Windows 10 client, we should see that he only has, interestingly, his lab base address. Um, in fact, this newer Windows 10 seems to be a little happier to say, I got the address from who I'm supposed to, and I'm going to keep it for a while. Uh, Windows 7 is a little more susceptible. Let's just see what he's got. And he's sitting over here with the two bad addresses. So in order to affect that change, let me bounce that interface right quick. And then I've got one more test to show. Enable, come back into Wireshark. We want to watch some of these uh, messages. Come on, scroll down. Come on, you can do it. Oh, there's a router solicitation. There's a solicit, two advertises, and it looks like that he got uh, a reply from maybe even both of them. Let's see what he's got. And, well, he too for the moment has. Great. But what's interesting, he still has his valid good address, but his DNS was derived from the other DHCP reply. So he already had this one in his cache. That's why he probably used it. But he did update his DNS, going to 2001, colon, colon, 1234. So he used a hybrid of those two replies. So actually, what I've done is something really crafty, unbeknownst to me, is I'm not telling the address, but I'm pointing them to another DNS, which could be me. Mwah. Probably not a good thing, all right? So I guess part of this bottom line uh, to come to here is the tests will do different things to different operating systems. doesn't matter necessarily even what the test is, right? Just showing a couple here. So one more, and it kind of proves the point. Let's go to the attacker. Let's shut him down. Um, remember the dad test? Remember that every... Every device, no matter what, Link Local, GUA, EULA, no matter how many they have, everyone's got to pass a DAD test to be a valid, usable address. It may be temporarily valid to use, but to continue on life, it's got to pass the DAD. And so I can craft, uh, in this particular case, with another one of the tools, um, a... Um, um, DOS new. A uh, uh, DOS attack. There it is. So I can effectively oh, say with sudo that I'm going to start a dad a denial service test, right? So what's going to happen is every time somebody comes online, so I want to validate this address, he goes, that's mine. His neighbor solicitation reply or neighbor advertisement reply is, I've got that. Okay, how about this one? I've got that. How about this? I've got that. All right. So effectively, nobody gets online, right? Well, not all operating systems actually follow and call the rules. It's very interesting. Right now, it's replying to um, addresses that haven't been asked for. They're already out there. But if I come over here, and this is where I found it the most interesting. That's the attacker. I want to go to the Ubuntu client. And I'm going to take the Ubuntu client, 
and I'm going to take it offline. And we're going to validate it. it's offline. He's got no v6 address on his link, which is expected. I'm going to put him back online. And he's got a v4 address. He's got a link local address. Oh, he's got a couple of link local addresses. He's got three link local addresses. Wait a minute. Why, how could it have three link local addresses? Really only supposed to ever have one on the same interface. Uh, I, I've actually never seen a config where I could have multiple link locals. But I, if I look at this another way, I start to see, yeah, I've got three, three addresses. I don't have, have, a, have my DHCP. And uh, effectively what has happened, I would say in that background is that those failed the dad test if i actually went over into wireshark i could start to see this come on wireshark and i've got a display filter for the dad test and oh got to get the right uh, uh profile to do come on wake up uh, IPv6, profile, dad. So the dad test, a really quick, easy way to tell the dad test is when you see enable solicitation to colon colon. All right, that's effectively one of the very few types of messages that we see with a double colon. And we could effectively start seeing a bunch of uh, some solicitations. And uh, eventually, if we also looked and for uh, ICMP v6, nope, CMP v6 dot type equal 136. Not quite happy with my logic. Oh, I know. This might do it. So what I'll start to see in here, if I can get down to the bottom of this, um, is especially at these link locals, uh, we can see some of these. Wait a minute. Nope, my bad. I lost my dad test. How about this? That might work. Nope. All right, I'm gonna back that out. I gotta work on my logic. The bottom line would be is that that attacker is answering to every dad test. Every new, new dad's devices try to come online. Uh, they'll be revoked at the link local. They sh uh, would be revoked on DHCPv6. If they just send out a DHCPv6 address or a request and a DHCPv6 server replies like Windows did very early on, those will get revoked. But not, in, not immediately. Again, remember the terministic dad says, go ahead and use it till you get the reply back or till you don't get a reply back. Actually be the way we'd prefer it. But in our case, we're going to get a reply back. Oh, wait, so I can't, I can't use it anymore. So you might add valid communications going, and then dad would fail and they'll stop. Some OSs will try again. Can I have another dad, please? And some OSs won't. It depends on how they're generating their interface ID. If they're using the UE, modified UE64 format, they only ask once because they only had one starting point. If they're using the random generator, random number generator process, what called the privacy extensions, they'll kind of keep going for a few times, maybe indefinitely, depends on the OS, all right? And you can't categorize it by Windows, Linux. It's, oh, Microsoft what, what? You know, Linux who? Down to the nth degree, all right? You can't say Ubuntu, all right? 
right? Different from at, at a category, you know, everything level. So uh, that's why part of the understanding is what do we have and what are we, what are we trying to accomplish and what I'm going to try to accomplish it with, right? And who all is going to be affected? Now, part of this is um, if I know I'm on a server network, I probably have a little bit fewer, uh, probably not even a good thing to say. I might have fewer things I have to deal with, you know, if I'm on a server side network as opposed to a client. If I'm on a voice VLAN, it makes it somewhat easier, right? If I'm on a printer VLAN, if I'm on a regular endpoint client VLAN, all right? Uh, even the server, I might have application servers, X, Y, and Z, or core servers, or whatever. I might be able to... Um, further tweak my uh, attack, what I'm trying to attack down by what I find out that's there. And that may take a little bit, right? But some of the regular what's there can be used, implemented as, as a, in addition to what specific V6 type attacks. There's a lot of, I would say a lot of other attacks. You can use a basic um, uh, in-map scanner to find out operating system to what it can, right? It's not completely golden for all operating systems in all flavors and versions of brands, but it can help. You can also often by looking at the, um, pardon me, the linked local addresses, especially if you look in between the um, sixth and seventh hextet and you see F, 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 F colon F, that's a UE64 address most likely. It's possible that it was derived from a random number generator, right? It could have FFFE, but that's kind of why they used FFFE, right? It's possibility is much smaller that it would duplicate the look of a, of a MAC address. It's not impossible, but it's less likely. And again, kind of knowing that most router uh, OSs will use the UE64 or static link local, kind of guides you to that, oh, that's probably a router or other maybe really core type. Uh, if you see six, the last 64 bits, I'm gonna call it just, you know, a number. Uh, and not every hex tet filled out, but you know, some values pretty much in, in, in the fixed, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth hex tet, it's probably used the random number generator process. It could also be DHCP. I'm generically finding though when people are setting up DHCP v6 servers they're setting them up they're setting their scopes up pretty much like the scope of the v4 however in microsoft windows DHCP v6 server the uh, scope um, uh, exclusions is reverse logic meaning you don't go build i want at least to be 100 to 110 you basically say i want it up to call and call in 99 and then call and call in 111. Except that doesn't quite work because 99 is not the one below 100, right? Because it's hex. Guess how I made that mistake? Why am I getting AF as my address? Oh, I got to go to call and call an FF. So my next one's 100. And then I would do, okay, let's do 120. And then I'd get 1A6. <sighs> So then I had to do colon, colon. Now I wanted 100 to 110, and then, you know, 111, 112, one, went to 120. And I had to do all the exclusion mini ranges and addresses that look just like. Oh, but guess what? Just because a client asked for a V4 and a V6 address, and they could both potentially get 100, does not mean they were. Just because the V4 was dot 100 does not mean you're going to get colon 100. So it, the logic is kind of interesting. But again, the the attack vector for DHCPv6 is probably on a lot of networks so far a much smaller last 64 bits we have to deal with until people figure this stuff out and they go oh well, we're trying to protect ourselves if folks are really wigging out because well v6 is i'm putting a, a routable address on the inside of my network it's unsecure i need NAT and NAT security and we laugh. That was security 20 years ago, maybe. Maybe not. But that is not security. No, there's no, no official NAT in V6. I'm not going to get into the arguments of, yes, there are a few NAT features. But generically, there's no NAT in V6. 
So if somebody throws out that, it's like, well, then you just need to be protecting on your forward facing stuff to block address blocks from being routable, you know, accessible and on and on and on. But I know it's quick. I thank you for staying over a little. I, I, I hope this was some helpful. All right, and give you some ideas. We'll get this posted. Let's give us some more information in the, uh, uh, the um, there is, and let me see if I've got it in here. There's a few books, all right, on V6 that I have listed, uh, and I forgot the other one. Uh, there is a book on IPv6 security. Um, I would say from the aspect of dated, it is it's a little old book. So it's in the later mid 2000s, um, but the authors kind of looked at it and said, for what they did and what they were talking about, it weren't really as much as this. The detail of this kind of stuff, more a higher level, enterprise looking thinking. Um, it's still valid, all right, because they didn't go into attacking and stuff like that. They didn't go into some of the other uh, components, more of security and designing of that security. So the IPv6 security essential good book still from that perspective. Most of the other V6 books are now in the uh, kind of middle 2010 era, all right? The ones that I've got listed are all the, the pretty much the latest V6 books. Uh, there's still been some RFC changes, and so you kind of have to watch those, um, um, see what's, you know, what's been added, what's been changed, what's being done, some of the things that have been brought up. Um, there is a, a relatively nice, um, uh, security RFC where they're talking about things that you should be doing again kind of more of the design but it also talks a little bit about what the attack vector is all right and how to maybe mitigate around that so um, there's lots of information out there and just not a lot of people looking at it not a lot of people think b6 and they're not sometimes knowing what they're doing all right that's and that's just a sad thing all right and then they're getting upset when stuff happens and sometimes it's not malicious, right? It, sometimes it's just a, a security check, right? You know, if you're brought in, one of the first things I would do is fire up Wireshark on a, on a on core segments, server segments, start there, and just search for router advertisements. Just let Wireshark display, filter out everything but the router advertisement. You may or may not see them. Then just look for V6 traffic because it's probably there. And even if it's only link local addresses, and and you know you maybe you're working on a specific uh, security scan, you know, and on purpose to to say, yeah, your other stuff looks act, but your V6 is wide open, and then they're probably going to go, what V6? All right, we're still kind of in that mode largely today, I would say, in a good portion of the network. Even at home, some of the ISPs are starting to light up, finally none of mine v6 capability and their modems are getting updated for v6 and because your clients are there most of the client operating systems are in for v6 if available it's a really cool thing they built a, a, a an rfc called happy eyeballs there was a problem when v6 was actually coming alive but not fully functional and since v6 was considered the preferred protocol they would start to do resolutions dns resolutions on v6 first when that failed it would go to try the dns resolution on v4 which means things were slowing down on networks people were complaining so the happy eyeball said okay if you've got v4 enabled and v6 enabled ask dns resolutions in both protocols in both resolution types so a v4 packet will send an a request and a quad a request resolution and v6 will do the same it will ask for a quad a and an a rec resolve so four dns requests will go out that client whatever comes back is what the client will try to use regardless of how it found out and this is great fun it could find out the v6 address from a v4 transported packet because it's just a quad a request with a quad a reply it's dns the stack knows how to strip that out www.domain.com got resolved to a v6 address i got v6 v6 works there i go but i i discovered it through v4 and that's really interesting traffic that's almost another thing you can do yes ah okay so ranges of v6 addresses that are quote allocated no 
not like we think of in V4, all right? IANA controls them, the, uh, and IANA provides the ranges to the five RIRs, and that's more extent of it, all right? So like in our case, you can go to Aaron easy enough and search on a company, X, or uh, let's just give it a domain, right? Whether it's a company or military or gov or whatever, and find out what their assigned address is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no doubt. Uh, I would expect that they have a, um, at least a, probably a slash eight. All right, which means the first 16 bits is given to them through IANA at the end of the result. And they've got the other 48 bits of network prefix to play with. And then you still have those 64 bits of host ID. So you, the, all that, you know, 128 minus 16 bits is there to play with. The key about this is, oh, and let me, let me kind of drop into that because there's another good point. If you're doing a router to router point to point link, we think of you only need two addresses, yes? That's the only two addresses that are operational. In a V4 world, we might give it a slash 30. Some router code give you, you can do a slash 31. And, and you, you've now taken that address block and partitioned it up into a bunch of little bitty router, router, point to point link pieces. In V6, it's still a slash 64. You're going to use two addresses out of the 18 billion billion and change addresses. And that was it. And every body freaked. I'm wasting addresses. V4 thinking, where we have been squeezing that V4 address block for so many years, right? Because it's only this big. It's a very small address block we can ever get in relative size. And so we're trying to maximum use. So we came up with all these great, cool things. V6, everything is slash 64. Gen There's no provision for client OSs to operate anything other than slash 64 today. Now, I'm not going to take into account hacks, blah, blah, blah. But they did come up with an RFC that said you can use a slash 127 for point-to-point -point links. There was a problem with slash 27. Oh, and colon colon zero is a valid address. 64 bits of all Fs is a valid address. That's not the same kind of thing in a V4 world, right? The dot zero and the dot 255 are the network and broadcast domain address. We don't have those in V6. So every address is valid. Colon colon zero is a U address. Colon, colon, one, and on and on and on. Call all Fs. Is. The problem was some of the older, uh, not older, yeah, the older routing code saw the colon, colon, zero as an address and would not allow it to be used as a transport address. And that had to get changed. So you could use a slash 126 and kind of get to the same thing. And most people have changed that. So, yeah, you can have bunches of addresses in the prefix, and then you still have 64 bits. That yeah, that gets that gives you your billion billions right off the bat. Other questions, comments? Yeah, we could do another one of these, but maybe do another level at some point uh, down the road. Um, I haven't mentioned to Phil, but I was thinking of: Do we need to do a Saturday half day workshop someday, where we maybe spend a little bit time again on basic V six? build up a little mini lab so everybody can play in their own domain and then go through some of these things. Ponder that. If you think that's of interest, send a note to Phil. Is that okay? And we'll, however, kind of work something out somewhere. Alex, I hadn't mentioned it. I just thought about it today. Um, but it, it's not. Uh, spend too much in some of the frontline stuff. But, again, I hope, I hope some of that foundation knowledge gives you those next thoughts. And you have to hear it again.
you, you have you're, it, to do those kind of uh, vulnerability scans, you're going to have to use crafted scans to help, but you're still, still could miss. That's considered, uh, I'm going to call it an issue or problem, but if I'm wanting to not fail the vulnerability, then to me, it's a good thing because I could probably hide it from you, try to do that test, right? But All right, that's all I've got for now. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you coming out and your time. All right. So. Yeah, we actually. Oh, that's fine. It just kind of sticks in here. Yeah, it just kind of pokes in here. Uh, he's, he may share the PowerPoint, what he does. Uh, let's see. Thanks to everyone that joined online, and uh, we are going to.